Hey, welcome back to the channel. Yes, it is. It's Friday, December 29th. The end of the week, right? Got the weekend off, hopefully most of you. And for us, it's going to be a long weekend because the first falls on Monday, so... You know, I'm the only one that's going to be down in the shop doing anything. You know, someone's still got to keep the fire going and uh, so that the propane furnace doesn't run that much. But I thought we talked a little bit today about when to say uncle when you're working on a piece of equipment. And then, is it feasible to keep good used old parts, okay? It's a lesson that I learned a long time ago, so stay with us. So, the first part, when to say uncle, you know, when you're working on a piece of machinery. It depends on a lot of factors. It goes into my thought process anyways. And that is, if you're running a shop, and the time that you're putting in on that piece of equipment is costing the customer money, then I have to take that into consideration, right? But... If I'm a homeowner and I'm taking apart something and I'm learning something from that experience, you know how we say, you know, t wisdom comes from experience and experience comes from time, you know, doing it. I would highly, let's, let's take the MS-170 because one of you guys asked, and I tried to answer the best that I could, you know, that you had bought that MS-170 chainsaw at a, an estate auction for 40 bucks. So you got 40 invested in it, okay? And you did a compression on it, and it's running at 45. The way... If you're not a shop, if you're just really a homeowner, okay? Because that's where time and cost come in. Or if you're just somebody starting out and you're not billing the customer, okay? The time spent tearing it apart and looking at how everything works has value, okay? If you're inexperienced or just getting into the business or like a homeowner wanting to learn more about how to do stuff that time is worth something too you know that it's a value added time is the way I look at it is you need to figure out how that unit works right and sometimes taking it apart and, and putting it back together has a lot of value when it comes to experience. And if you've never taken one apart, then it's exceptional value because now you're... It's an exceptional value if you plan on working on most of your stuff in the future is the best way to put it. Because you have to learn, right? And you can watch all the videos you want. You can read all the books you want. All the tech bulletins you want. But when it comes right down to it, you're the one turning the wrenches. And you're the one tearing it apart. And when we're training a new mechanic, and usually they're young, that's one of the first things that I want them to do is if we have a unit come in and the customer it's a quick diagnostic that the, the the compression is too low on it 
or there's something on it that makes it not worth putting the money into. I will, on my time, sit with them and help them learn how to completely tear it all apart and what to look for. You know, how, how does the piston work? How do the rings work? You know, look at the scoring in the jug. Is it straight up and down where it's going to allow the oil to come up? Or is it simply a little bit like this that doesn't really have a big factor? But it should be as smooth as possible. How does the top of the piston look? You know, you're not going to know unless you tear it apart. And if, if all you do is just throw a compression tester on something and call it, you know, that's it. If that's the case, that's fine, right? But we've done a lot of rebuilds here. And rebuilds usually on the big bigger twins. If we just need to do a set of rings or something like that on it. Which it yeah, rings, gasket sets and stuff. And that's where running a compression tester on a, on a motor and finding out she's running low on one cylinder and not the other, that you're going to have to go farther. Because most customers, if they're looking at a new motor or a complete rebuild of the old motor, they're going to be looking at a grand, okay? Whereas if I order a set of rings for just the one side, and a lot of times what we'll do is we'll, I'll order two sets. We'll do both sides at the same time. So that we've got a fresh set of rings in both jugs, all right? In both pistons. Looking at maybe 30 bucks for a set of rings times two, there's 60. And Claude can knock that out in two and a half, three hours. So you're looking at right around three, 350 in labor. Call it $340, $400, and that machine is back running again. No, it's not like a brand new one or a completely rebuilt one from the ground up, but it will suit the customer's needs for years to come. Most of the cases that we've had that we've done that, the customers used on and on and on, and some of them are still going 10, 12 years out. Depends on how well the customer takes care of it, right? So that's how I would answer that question is if you're a homeowner and you're and you want to learn more about how to repair stuff there's value in that just tearing it apart and in the case of the MS 170 with my customer if I took the 40 for diagnostic and let them have the aftermarket, you know, for 32 to 44. You got to add some on to that to make some little bit of money on the parts, right? So bump it up to $65. So now we're at $125 into that saw. And that's not counting the time that we need to tear that completely down, put in a whole new jug system with a crank. It's, it's complete. You just set it in and bolt everything back to it. But that takes time, okay? And so you're probably looking at two to three hours to, to do that, maybe two hours. So there's another 120. So now you got $245. And that's not touching, like, with in your case, you, with a brake system on it. Now you're going to have to go out and, and I would buy used. Uh, I don't know how you could run a, a system with a brake on, to be honest with you. But unless the brake system isn't operating functionally the way it should be. I mean, it just seems weird to me because a chain brake is a chain brake. It just locks the... the Plus right up, so it can't turn. But you have to find those parts and stuff. So if we had to do that on the saw, you see where I'm going? 
and for under 200 bucks like it's 199 plus tax 200 and some and change you can get a brand new one with a warranty so how can i justify to my customer a bill of around 300 bucks for a rebuild with a aftermarket jug system and crank when they could have gone and bought a brand new one from steel with a warranty for 200 and change but that's what i mean it depends on the situation it depends on what you're doing now if you're a homeowner and you're not counting your time because it's part of a learning lesson or if you're uh getting into this business and you're trying to become a a new repair person you're going to have to figure out how everything works and you're going to have to be where you're not scared of tearing stuff down the biggest thing i can tell any of you guys when it comes to engines and is pay attention to how you took it apart get a good clean working area you know, I used the big table like yesterday with the other MS-170 that came in. And I laid the parts out <clears throat> as I was taking them apart. So the first part that I took off, I put it at the farthest distance away from me. And then kept getting closer and closer. Because I know if I do it that way, when I get ready to assemble it, that's the order I got to put it back in at, right? Right? And you're not going to be like, well, what's this extra nut for? <laughs> Which I used to do when I was younger. On the farm, I'd have extra parts left over. So, yes. If you're a homeowner, yes. If you're starting out in the business, yes. If you're trying to learn mechanical skills, these saws like that are great for it. Even if you don't fix it, they're still great to tear down part by part and look at how everything works and, and find out, you know, simply, well, if it didn't have any compression, why didn't it have compression? Well, pop it apart. That's the way to learn. I mean, are the, the rings wore right out? Did the cylinder wall get scored? Did something drop in, let loose? put one of the rings, bust, and let loose it, and score the cylinder. There's a lot of things that can happen. And I, for us, we can't do that on the customer's back, right? And if I pay an employee to, to fix something, we're not going to even touch that. But if I got a new guy in there, and he has never seen it before, then I... I count that as part of the learning process of, all right, come with me. We'll set it out on the big table, get everything cleared out, and I want you to tear that right apart. And I'll stand right here with you, and we'll go through everything you have a question on, and then I want to see you put it all back together. Because tearing it apart is only half the equation, you know. And even if you have the right parts, it's putting it all back together is the end of the, the line, right? So that brings us to the other part is, is it worth keeping salvage parts around? And I would say yes and no. Yes, on the, the late model stuff, the stuff that's still being used, no on the older stuff. Now, granite, I have a friend of mine that is in the uh, boat business, per se, okay? And he found his niche. You know, when we were doing eBay, he found his niche by buying up old outboards, tearing them apart, inventorying them, and then listing them on eBay. Because he'd asked me how I did my business. So I told him, I said, this is the way to do it. So he started listing them on eBay. And he used, I think it was Access. It was a database system. 
And he would give everything an assigned number based on the part number. And he would take the time in his early time in the early years because he was learning as well of and going to college on top of that. Then he would start this business basically out of a shed. And he kept getting bigger and bigger, so he's got tons of buildings. And each building has got their own like A and B and C. And then once you go into the building, it has A and then shelf A1, A2, A3, you know, right down through. And he can tell you where every part is that he's got there. And he can find it either by using the actual OEM part number or his assigned location number, right? But he can just walk and, and he knows exactly where it is. In that case, I would say, yeah, it's 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 good to get into the salvage use parts. Because of what he does is he stays with the, the late model stuff. He was doing a lot of the older stuff. And there's a segment that, that does restorations on them and will buy those parts. I'm not saying he turns them away, away but he doesn't spend a lot of money on those. What he's looking for is like the the newer 40 horse and up outboards. And if they've got a you know blown engine, this or that, he'll take and he'll buy. He'll go to marinas and he will buy up all their you know newer engines that are out there that are scrapped basically to that marina. And he'll bring them home and now he's got I think two or three Amish that disassemble them. And then he's got a younger brother that uh catalog so I mean, he brings them okay he knows the part numbers he's got the breakdown of that engine and he's putting part numbers and assigning numbers to where that is going to go and if they got like two of the same engine they're going to have more than one part in that location for let's say you know a, a electric start for a 75 horse mercury but what i know what i can tell you is it takes a lot of storage area I mean, he's got a lot of storage area. And if you're just doing it to, for your own, like a repair shop, and you're wondering what to keep, not to keep, you're kind of selling only to a small segment, and that is to the segment that says, you know, that it's okay to put a used part on their piece of equipment. Whereas a friend of mine with the outboard thing, a lot of marinas are buying like the lower units off from the starters and this and that to repair units all over the U.S. for their customers. So they've got a bigger base of customers that want good quality used parts. And he's made a name for himself on the parts. He doesn't sell junk. If it's iffy, he trashes it. Goes right into the aluminum bin. Or steel bin. But I've seen guys and gals that will start doing that. You know, trying to inventory and keep everything that comes through. You know, like every chainsaw comes through, you kick the cover off, take the rewind, you got this, you got that. You know, bars and chains come and go, you can sell them pretty easily. Or use them yourself, whatever. But it doesn't take long when you're doing that to start looking like a hoarder that you need intervention. And I'm serious. You know, when we had the bigger building, we, we were doing a lot of dismantling and putting stuff on shelves that we knew that we could use down the road. But here's the problem. Is you start getting a bunch of the same parts and they get put into a box and they get moved around on shelves and you want the shelf space so you move it to the bottom tuck it up into the corner and that's the last you'll ever see of it and when you could use that part 
you can't find it. You only find it after you've bought a replacement from another hoarder, right? So what ends up happening is you have a bunch of boxes of, of parts that you'll never use. At least in our case, we didn't. And then when it came to the outdoor power equipment, you know, like the lawnmowers and weed eaters and, you know, push mowers, tillers, within four years and where the shop sits now I've got a little over three acres down there and they're not it's not zoned where if you've got some junk lawnmowers sitting in your yard that they're going to say anything but we kept everything in back where it was out of sight but within four years of buying you know, used machines, taking customers' machines in on their bill, this or that. I ended up with almost filling that lot with equipment. Granted, over that past four years, we used a lot of the starters. Uh, we'd snap engines out and swap them out for customers. It was the same engine that was in theirs that blew up. Seats, you know. Transmissions, you know, you name it. We were, you know, parts robbing off from all that equipment that was up there. But then there comes a time when you can't fit any more up there, right? So what I ended up doing was I hired a guy to come in with his excavator with a thumb on it set up uh, he had the, the big bins and he had a tractor trailer that he was a scrap guy and he came in and he cleaned it all up you know and in the process of cleaning it all up there was enough tonnage that I got paid six grand for all that crap that was left and it was so nice with it all cleaned up So, I don't keep stuff around too much anymore, and I kind of slowed down on the buying of stuff. Uh, I think I was watching, I think it's that chicken mechanic here a week or two ago, something about that they closed their shop down. And I, it made me laugh because I looked at her inventory. And her inventory is exactly what I'm telling you about. Is she is, her and her husband have kept all the rewinds, you know, any part they thought they could use on a customer's machine. And we, we did the same thing. And if you look in those videos, you'll see just boxes of them with dust on it where they've been under the shelves, where it never been seen in years. And that's what happens when you start <laughs> you start looking like a hoarder. And, you know, if you need intervention, we can get intervention for you. But that's what our shop looked like. We looked like hoarders. You know, we had shelves right full of parts with, you know, tags on it saying exactly what the part number was, what it went to. And they were good quality used parts. When you went to get them, to use them, you could never find them. And where were they? Tucked in on the bottom couple of shelves with dust all over them. Never to be seen again. And the only reason she's seeing them is because they're moving out of her old one and putting them into her garage. <laughs> and she's got a lot of new old stock. You know, same here. You're a hoarder. All right, so on that note, I hope it helps kind of solve the problem of is it worth fixing or not if 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 you're a homeowner and you're you want to experience or you're uh, new to the business and you you want to become a good repair person i would say tear it apart you know i wouldn't say tear it apart on a customer machine i would tear it apart on my own or you know as we have at our shop 
we have a, a boneyard that's very full. If we can bring down a chainsaw, a weed eater, what have you, and have a new mechanic tear it all apart just to see how it works. But you can't do it on the customer's time. You have to do it on your time. So on that note, you guys have a great day. And I don't know if I'll get one out tomorrow or not with going up to my daughter's, but I may have time in the morning before to kind of give a personal growth type try to get that mixed in you know the personal growth and the the repair shop because i think it goes hand in hand with the business your home life and being a better person a better man a better woman if you like what you're seeing hit the like button subscribe if you can and share it and i guess the bell gives you notifications when mine's coming out my I have a weekday show that's like this one. And I usually knock out a couple on the weekend, and I try to... I, I did a video yesterday. I had another MS-170 come in, and that one, the guy said he couldn't get it to run. So I did a video on that one. So that'll be hopefully up this afternoon. You guys have a great weekend. And thanks so much for being part of this channel. You know, if it wasn't for you, I'd be just sitting here talking to myself. I'd have to get, like, Jeff Dunham or whatever, get puppets so that they could talk to me. <laughs> All right. Catch you later.